Yes. I think it's going. All right, I see a little red button. I think we're good. Okay, should we get started? Yes, please. I'm going to mute myself now. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming back. Uh, on behalf of Black and Robotics, as well as Black Women in AI, um, you know, I want to say thank you again. And uh, I am extremely privileged to help you on your journey with your uh, efforts and desire to learn robotics. Uh, so for this particular session, we're going to be working through the software portion uh, of the Intro to Robotics workshop. In the last session, uh, we tried to go through the steps in building the Hattabot. Uh, we didn't get to complete it in the two hour time frame that we were given, but hopefully you got to complete it, uh, complete the whole turtle kit um, on your own, but no worries if you didn't. As I mentioned before, this workshop is, uh, you're gonna get quite a bit from this session, even if you didn't complete your, your uh, Hattabot um, actual hardware kit. And also if you didn't get to fully install your software uh, setup, that's also okay. Um, but hopefully you got it, you got it all working. Um, and uh, in the end, I'll mention it again, if you need help to put together the robot and or to set up the software, I'm more than willing to help. But moving onward, um, so robotics is hard. The, what makes it hard is the hardware is difficult. Uh, you gotta learn, you gotta know about electronics. You gotta learn about uh, some electrical engineering. Um, the software is difficult. There's a lot of pieces and infrastructure, uh, specifically if you're using ROS to get the software set up. And last but not least, the theories and algorithms are not easy as well. It's a multidisciplinary um, subject where you need to know some probability, probability, linear algebra. You obviously need to know computer science. So nothing is easy about robotics. And oftentimes they'll feel like you're trying to fix a car while it's moving. Um, and on top of all of this, you're, this may be your first endeavor into robotics. And uh, this is combined with the fact that this is the first workshop we're giving as an introduction to robotics. So again, I, I really appreciate everyone's patience as we work through all the kinks and hiccups. Um, we're improving by doing and by giving this workshop. You guys are really helping us improve the quality of the workshop for future participants. So with that said, um, what will we do today? And we're going to assume that you have the Hattabot kit assembled and the software all set up. But as I said before, if you didn't get to do all that, that's totally fine. You're still gonna learn a whole bunch from this session. We're gonna dive right in into ROS2 and describe to you uh, the, the architectural design or the, the, the philosophy behind ROS, um, certain tools that you will need to compile uh, ROS2 code and uh, introduce you to ROS2 concepts. More specifically, there's uh, ROS2 nodes and ROS2 topics and messages, which we will describe uh, later on this session. And we're going to run through and um, play with a, some ROS2 command line interface commands. And uh, we'll give a show and tell about what those actually are afterwards. And last but not least, whenever we can tie it back to some Hattabot code, C, specifically the code be written in C++, we will do so as well. I'm gonna pause here, um, punch in the chat if you have any questions so far. Okay, I think we're good to go. So as I mentioned before, we're gonna focus on ROS. Really this session is gonna be about ROS. So that gets you guys a good understanding of what ROS is by the time the session is over. We will not be doing a whole bunch of things uh, just to set everyone's expectations. If you got hard, had about hardware problems or software uh, setup problems, um, I'm not gonna talk about that in this session. And I'm gonna leave that as a offline um, task where uh, you can reach out to me and I'll reach out to you to see if there's any issues. I'm extremely motivated 
to get you fully up and running with uh, all the how to buy hardware and software capabilities. But uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to do that too much today because everyone's problems will probably be pretty unique. We're not going to go through any Linux commands. I know some of you might be Windows users and the, some of the Linux commands that are used to go through uh, the software is, um, is going to be a little foreign. But uh, again, um, happy to help offline with that. Um, Hadabot itself is actually uh, architected in a way that is not raw specific. Um, we use various technologies which have nothing to do with raw, such as MicroPython. We use a microcontroller that is uh, also um, not raw specific. We use Docker, and clearly that's not raw specific. We're not going to go too much into about Hadabot architecture. That's a totally different beast. If you guys are interested, again, more than happy to talk about it, but probably best offline. Or if there's enough interest, happy to even give a discussion and a follow on uh, workshop about that. And last but not least, robotics uh, algorithms and theories is, uh, is you know, pervasive with any sort of robotics talk. But to try to keep the talk focused on ROS, we're not going to talk about any sort of specific robotics algorithms. Um, some, some keywords or key concepts that might pop up as we look through the code might be odometry. Maybe I'll mention the word kinematics. I'll, I'll try to refrain from talking too specifically about robotics. But that's, that's also a topic for another workshop. And uh, it'll be a little more advanced. Um, but in, as with everything else, if you do want, have some questions about that, more than happy to answer, but let's take that offline. Any questions so far, what we're going to do, and what we're not going to do? Cool. All right. So um, before we go on, I like to give a show and tell about what uh, sort of the, what is, what we're assume that you got working. And again, if you don't have it working, no problem. You're going to get a lot out of the session, but here's my Hadabot. And I have, if I could find through all my hundreds and thousands of windows here, my, uh, the, hold on here, my web page, which has the teleop controller. So if I push the up arrow on the teleop controller, uh, it should move forward. But Chad, it is not. Can, can you push the plus on the window where you have the slides open so that we can see the teleop controller you're pressing? Is that possible? Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, well, in the chat, are you guys able to see my face? No one's able to see the face. Okay. Um, you stop sharing, we'll see your face. Right. Let me try to figure that out. If you put your cursor over the, yeah, there you go. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Let me do one thing. I got to restart my robot. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. We'll tell robot jokes while we wait. Sounds good. This is the, the demo gods are never, ever happy. <laughs> it's called Murphy's Law. That's what we used to do in my robotics research lab. Whenever some distinguished visitor was coming, we knew the robot was not going to work. No, it never, never <laughs> works. All right, let's see if I... Oh, beautiful. Oh, right. It doesn't work. I know why it doesn't work, because I didn't run my, um, my code. Now I got to find my other window. <laughs> One sec here. I gotta actually run Ross. All right, here we go. Uh, now I lost my my Zoom screen. All right, here we go. All right, so this is going forward. I'm clicking that up arrow, left arrow, and right arrow. Is it using the encoders at this point, or it's just straight purely open loop driving? It's open loop driving. Um, so for those who uh, who want to be totally confused with uh, terminologies. We are not using a PID controller. Okay. It is uh, for simplicity purposes, it's hard coded to drive forward and left okay. and not worry about actual speed. All right. Uh, all right, so let's see, I'm gonna go back to Sharon. Let's see if I could do this. Where is my screen here? Okay. All right, okay. Everybody see the screen okay? okay. So um, first off, so you got to see an example of the teleoperation. Uh, the teleoperation for the Hadabot robot runs entirely on ROS. 
And now this begs the question, what is actually ROS? Um, so ROS is actually not an operating system. <clears throat> it is, it, it's a little bit of a misnomer. Operating system entails you have some sort of memory management, has the address space management. It's more like a middleware framework, um, much like a web framework such as Django or Ruby on Rails. It is a framework that constrains the users to implement uh, your robotics application in a certain way. And more specifically, that certain way enforces um, modularization. It forces the user who uses ROS to implement robotics uh, like a component in, in, in as components. So what does that mean? For instance, if you bought a new sensor, uh, a new um, laser sa scanner sensor, you can implement a ROS component that enables you to capture scans using this new laser scanner, and it will be reusable by someone else, perhaps you're either your lab colleague or a open source collaborator to take your ROS component and reuse it for their actual robotics purposes. So they can basically buy the same laser scanner that you just bought use the laser scanner component, ROS component that you just built and plug it into their robot application. Another example would be you bought a specific robot arm or a robot uh, smart server, so smart servo to control the arm. You can implement a ROS component to, to move this arm in certain ways and your colleagues can just reuse this component. In addition to sensors and actuators, you can also write components that implement specific algorithms, such as you, know, you just implement, you just researched a fantastic new way of doing mapping. Now you can, uh, in, instead of writing code and making people have to compile against your code and worry about library linkages, et cetera, you just write a ROS component that uses your map mapping algorithm and you document what this component needs as an input and you map, you document what it will dump out as an output and you can ship this out to your colleagues or other um, research collaborators to basically use your algorithm. So in summary, ROS is a way to enforce, is a framework to enforce modularity and shareability. Any questions? I see Julie asked a question. So it's a library. So Julie, it is a library, but it's um, like any, any framework. A framework is also a library. A framework is more than a library. A library is, is a set of calls or APIs that allows you to do certain, certain complicated things in a high level way. A framework actually forces you to implement things in a certain, under a certain philosophy architectural philosophy. Does that make sense, Julie? Let me know if I, you need further clarification. Okay, well, um, assume, I assume everything's okay. Julie, if you have any other questions or uh, if that's still confusing, happy to, uh, happy to expand on that offline. Angel's so, asking about a related slide. Can you show the related slide? Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little lost, Angel. Uh, which related slide are you talking about? This one or? I see the first slide of the presentation. Oh. Oh yeah, you're not in present mode, Jack. You gotta go up to um, view, present. So it's sitting on the same slide while you talk. I it's think that right. might be what you're so see, look at the menu at the top and click view present. Is that better? You see, you see view, uh, we're still on, you're not presenting the slideshow, you're just showing us the first slide. That is Take really it. weird because mine's actually in present presentation mode. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. Maybe come out of it and go back in again. Sounds good. Yeah. Right, so. You present and then share, like make the, make the present first and then share. Okay, hold on, let me see this here. That. Thanks, Angel. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's like uh, I felt like I was talking in mute the whole time. Yeah, we could see the slides. 
okay, view present. Yeah, it's still not presenting. It's not showing the show. It's showing, yeah, that's weird. Huh. All right, I'm going to. Uh, now, not, now nothing shows up. I just really see, we can see it. You can see the actual presentation. We see the slides. What about now? Do you see Still slides? See slides? Still see the slides. Yep. The first slide, you mean? No, we see what is Ross. What is Ross? Not teleoperation. No. Uh, okay. You gotta be able. You know, I may have to do your slides for you because you ought to be able to do your show. Why do you right. have two cursors? I see a black cursor. Like if you put your black cursor on view show, it's disappearing. Why is it doing that? Hmm. All right. Should I hand off the, uh, should I hand off host to you and go from there? Um, yeah, let, let's try that. Give me one second to get my duckies back in a row. Cause I took it down when we decided you were going to do it. Okay, all right, guys, good. this is all part of the demonstration. Please be patient for just a second. I'm going to get the slides up and running. And I'll, I'll continue fiddling around with this sharing. I don't know why we're not getting any love today in technology land. <laughs> All right, not here. Pause video, show names. I'm concerned that when you do this, it's going to turn off the recording too. I may have to re record. I think so. Optimize screen share for video. But that's clip. okay. We'll, we'll get it all back. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Interesting. Let me try to share another another screen then. Would this work? So okay. no one's seeing no one's seeing my uh, my window. We see your slides. We can see your speaker notes. We're seeing like basically what you edit your slides. We don't see the presentation. What about the? Uh, is is it on what we will learn and do? Correct. Is we, it is. All right. But let me try the again. Speaker notes are up as well. Yeah. All right. Let me see this. What about now? Yeah, it says, what is Ross? What about now? Mm, what is Ross? What about now? Is it moving? Nope, what is Ross? Still, what is Ross? <laughs> yes. Brutal. <laughs> All right, you know what? Let me try one last thing. It's not going to look pretty, but I think it'll work. Okay. So you guys should see what is Ross, but it's, it's in my browser window. Is that right? Yes. Okay, let's just do this. You guys can click through it. That's fine. We, um, I just wasn't able to see, you know, the topics you were discussing. At a yeah, that's fine. I agree. Just, just you stay as a host, Jack. Just click through it. Like okay. Can't, but now, now we should it. see. Do we see teleoperation controller? How about driver? Correct. Okay. Correct. Fantastic. Let's just do this then. It's not pretty, but whatever. <laughs> It's not as good as the, not as sexy as the full screen mode, but uh, it'll work. Okay, so we were, we talked about Ross. We talked the fact that it's a middle, middleware slash framework to impose uh, or to enforce modularity as well as shareability. <clears throat> In terms of what that means for um, the teleoperation example that you saw, uh, you, what we've done, what Ross has done is basically modularize three main components of the teleop example that we just showed and tell a few slides ago. Um, there is a teleoperation and controller component, which effectively modularizes the website with uh, the four arrows. Um, it modularizes the driver code that takes commands from the website and turns it into turtle specific commands or, or real specific commands actually. Um, and then we have a, the actual Hadabot turtle uh, component, which takes the wheel drive commands, left and right wheel and how they turn, and then actually, and, and then f fires off the pins to turn the actuators on the, uh, the robot or the motors on the robot. Does that make uh, sense to everyone? They see sort of uh, the, three, the three modules of the teleop, um, of the tele teleop example. If, if there's some confusion, punch it in the chat. Great. Well, it might be also worth mentioning that without Ross, 
what you're going to be inclined to do is just implement all three of these components in one piece of code, which ends up being quite a mess. And Ross, with Ross, if you're forced to think about these things in a modular way, what happens is you can actually replace certain modules. So for instance, you don't, you just, uh, rather than a hat about turtle, you just made a, let's say your lab created a, a bigger robot with two wheels. You can just plug the driving code underneath the Hadabot driver for your new robot. And you don't have to change anything above it to give your new robot teleoperating, um, teleoperating functionality. Similarly, on the top end, right now you have a web-based teleop controller with four buttons. You can remove that component, implement, say, your joystick controller, and plug that on top of the Hadabot driver. And now you can teleop your Hadabot turtle with a totally different type of controller. It's a physical joystick controller now without having to change the driver code or any of the code that drives the actual um, motors on the robot. That makes sense? So, uh, if that doesn't make sense, uh, let me know in the chat. Okay. Moving onward, uh, so we talked about how Ross enforces modularity. What does that actually mean? Modularity for all practical purposes in ROS are called ROS packages. So now we're kind of moving into real into ROS specific nomenclature land. ROS packages are the modular components for a specific robot. Uh, for is the modular code for a specific robot component that you want to implement. So let's say you going back to the um, the laser scanner example that we talked about before. You bought a new laser scanner. You want to write a, a a ROS module that will make use of this new laser scanner. You would create a ROS package for this new laser scanner. You might call it you know laser scanner X Y Z driver. Um, the ROS package is nothing more than a folder really that consists of a bunch of expected files. Um, the two most important ones is the cmakelist.txt and package.xml. So when you're looking through ROS code, if you see these two files, it likely defines a specific ROS package of which it's the parent folder name. So in our specific case, it's Hadabot driver. That's the ROS package that we implemented. In the ROS package, you're going to have to have source code. So there's a SRC folder there might be some include folders as well and as your as your package increases in complexity complexity likely you'll have more files your ros so you have a whole bunch of these ros packages to make a ros robot application you put together a bunch of packages that your ros application care about this ros application in ros nomenclature land is called a ros workspace so for instance, if you had a really complicated self-driving robot, a self, uh, self-driving car robot, you might have a ROS workspace called um, self-driving robot underscore workspace. And you might have a bunch of packages underneath, say, um, you know, uh, the say a pedestrian detection package, a Ackerman drive package, a LIDAR object detection package. All these would be listed under the SRC folder of your workspace directory. Pause here for a sec. Anybody um, have questions about what a ROS workspace is, what a ROS package is? You know, in summary, a ROS workspace is just a series of ROS packages that implements a robot application of your choice. Okay, moving forward, um, to compile your ROS workspace, uh, you undertake a series of commands. First, you would need, what you would need to do is to set up your environment to do this ROS compilation, and that's done through sourcing a, uh, a, a ROS-specific environment setup script called setup.bash. And this has been the case ever since ROS was created uh, over 10, 15 years ago. And that automatically sets up your ROS environment so that it has all the libraries linked, it sets up all the, um, 
all the auto tap capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Once you get that environment set up, CallCon is the build tool, build tool for ROS2. And you, when you go into your workspace directory, when you say CallCon build, CallCon looks through under your source directory for all the packages listed for your workspace and compiles. The Simleak install is, uh, is, is just a fancy option to rather than uh, have um, object files be copied all over the place and, and post compile binaries be copied all over the place. It just symbolically links to them and saves a little bit of space. So um, analogous to what you would do for make, typing in make your project, CallCom is basically Ross's really glorified make script. Any questions so far? Okay. Once your compilation is complete, you now have created perhaps one or more uh, ROS, ROS binaries that can be executed. It all got installed in a subfolder or everything got compiled into a subfolder called install underneath your workspace. So in parallel to that first source directory, you'll see an install directory. That install directory also has a environment setup script so that you can set up your ROS environment, or you could add to your ROS environment all the binaries, the, the paths, all the binaries that you just compiled that are in your ROS packages. Does that make sense? Okay. So what does that mean in terms of actual code? Um, for those who have the your software environment set up, we can you can uh, actually go through some of these steps with me if you like. I will cut and paste the actual steps into the chat here. And all you need to do is to pull up two terminals uh, in your VS Code environment. And the VS Code environment is a web browser-based environment, which is built into the Hattabox software development stack. It uh, effectively loads the VS Code that's running in your Docker container and displays it through the web browser and allows you to interact with the, uh, the, the container operating system, which is set up with ROS. Uh, this, uh, the steps to get that up and running are posted in the chat. Um, the specific icons which are mentioned in the in the chat as well as on the slide are pointed to with the various arrows. You can um, hopefully you get a mental snapshot. I'll give give the participants a sec to take a mental snapshot, and I'll move on to the next step. Anybody want me to pause a little bit longer to get the setup, or uh, if I don't hear anything, I'm just going to move on. So as a first show and tell, uh, we talked about ROS, ROS packages and stuff gets compiled. What does that mean? Well, what gets compiled are actually ROS nodes. And you can think of ROS packages. You can think ROS workspace is a collection of ROS packages. A ROS package implements a series of post compile ROS nodes that run. A ROS node is nothing more than an executable that runs in the ROS environment. So for instance, in our package, Hadabot driver, in those configuration files, specifically the CMake list file that we defined here um, in, the, in the package, there is, a, we define a Hadabot controller. That Hadabot controller targets the Hadabot controller.cpp. And that compiles into a ROS node, which can get executed. And you can actually, if you search around in your stall directory, you'll see a Hadabot controller binary. And if you set up your, if you set up a whole complicated slew of ROS environment variables, you can actually just run the binary on its own. But ROS uh, tries to keep things simple. 
Instead, it offers a simple command to help you run these binaries without having to, in a complicated manner, set up your environment. And that's with this ROS2 run command. And this runs, so this ROS2 run command sets up the environments, environment variables to help you run the Hadabot controller binary from your Hadabot driver package. And as a result, it kicks off that modular box that we saw before in the middle called Hadabot driver. Okay. Um, there are a whole bunch of ROS command line interfaces, and uh, you can actually see a whole bunch if you got your terminal window set up. If you just type in ROS2 dash dash help, you'll see a whole list of ROS commands or subcommands, and you can get help to each subcommand by typing in the dash dash help to each of the subcommands. So for instance, in the previous command, ROS2 run to kick off a ROS node, if you do ROS2 run dash dash help, you can get more information about the command. We want, we do, we're talking about ROS2 nodes. To get a list of all the nodes on your ROS2 environment, you can use the ROS2 node list command. Most ROS robotics applications might yield, might lead to tens or even hundreds of ROS nodes. Uh, you can imagine a, uh, a two-armed driving robot to have um, a whole bunch of complicated packages that operate various sensors, various actuators. To get a list of these, you would just type in ROS2 node list. But for our specific Hadabot uh, implementation, if you do ROS2 node list, you will see just two nodes. The Hadabot controller, which we launched in our previous command, as well as a ROS2 web bridge, which is the um, which is the ROS node that automatically gets kicked off in when you when you start the Hadabot container stack, and that controls the web UI for the uh, for the tele operation. Uh, for a ROS node, it's as I mentioned before, it's nothing more than a compiled executable, and the way to implement a ROS node is to create a class, an object class that inherits a ROS node, a superclass ROS node. And in it, uh, you implement your various robot capabilities, which we'll show you a little bit later. Um, but uh, in the end, all you need to do is create a main because it's just an executable, so it has to have a main. And in the main, initializes ROS. It instantiates your, your node object, in our case, Hadabot controller, and it, it throws, it, um, it registers this, this ROS node in a ROS runtime. And the ROS runtime, the reason why you see a spin, the ROS runtime is nothing more than a huge while loop that goes on forever. And every single time the loop executes, various things happen, which we'll talk about in a bit, until you control C and break out of your node. So for those of you who tried the teleop example, when you run the Hadabot controller using your ROS2 run, it, it doesn't stop until you hit control C. You like your terminal window, basically, uh, you, you can't get access to your terminal window again until you hit control C. And that's because that node is in this ROS runtime spin loop and it spins forever. Any questions so far? From a scale of one to five, one where I'm totally confused, five is I totally get it, and three is I'm following along uh, enough such that I'm not, I'm not totally falling off the cliff. Can people punch in what their rating is so far? All right, three from Carlotta. Anyone else? Everyone else, uh, four. Cool. All right. <laughs> that's confusing. That's, uh, in, that's encouraging. Sorry. That's not as confusing. I'm glad you're not as confused. Anyone else? 
Oh, Angel, I was asking for the, for people who are listening uh, right now, from a scale of one to five so far, are you, one is you're totally confused, I have no idea what's going on, five is I totally get it, three is I'm following along enough such I'm not going to fall off the cliff on the next slide, um, which one would you be like, from a scale of one to five? <laughs> Based on your answer, okay. <laughs> I don't know what really that means, but uh, I'm going to move, move ahead, assuming that most people on average is a three. So we talked about the, uh, we talked about the Ross runtime loop spinning forever. And every single time the loop loops around, uh, Ross runtime does something. Well, what does it do? So in order for the nodes to be effective in a modular way, there, there has to be some way the nodes communicate information to each other. And the way Ross does this is through a, um, a publisher subscriber architecture. And this is actually a pretty common architecture for a lot of, uh, a lot of different types of um, software design. Uh, even um, web-based applications use subscriber, uh, publisher subscriber architecture. And what that really means is you have two different applications, a way of communicate these applications to communicate e to each other and the communication, there's a communication channel, kind of like you're, you, you picked up your phone and you call a specific phone number. And then there's also the type of, uh, there's also, you also need to define what the language you're actually going to speak through this channel. In Ross Talk, the phone number or the channel is called a topic name. And the language you will speak is called the message type. In our specific case for Hadabot, the Hadabot controller is a subscriber. The ROS2 web bridge, which is the interface for our web, uh, our web teleop uh, UI interface, that's a publisher. The publisher publishes a ROS topic called Hadabot Command Vel. And this is basically just a string name, really. It's no different from a phone number. I'm going to call your phone number. And then when you pick up the phone at the other end as a subscriber, uh, no one else can hear what we're communicating. The message type, which is the, i.e. the language that is spoken through the channel or the topic is called a twist message type. And we'll talk, we'll, def we'll, we'll show and tell what that actually is in a bit. But um, each time, the Ross runtime cycles through. The orchestration of how the publishing and subscribing happens uh, occurs during each, the, each one of these loop iterations. So at each cycle, one of these subscriber nodes will effectively go, hey, is there a message I care about on the Hadabot command veil topic channel? And each time the cycle loops through, similarly for the publisher node, they'll be given an opportunity to push for, uh, push a twist message through the Hadabot command vel topic. Does that make sense? If you're confused or want me want me to further clarify, let me know. Okay. In code, here's a subscriber code. It's in C++, but if you look, if you go to the Let's see if I can find it here. The source under the source directory of your ROS package of the Hadabot driver ROS package, there's a Hadabot controller.cpp. If you look in that CPP file, you will find this subscriber code, this create subscription code, which creates a twist subscription uh, in the Hadabot controller class instantiation. And what this does is it says, I want to subscribe to the Hadabot command veil topic, topic or phone number slash channel. And each time there's a message that comes through, I want you to call the twist callback routine. And further down in the instantiation of this Hadabot controller object, node object, you know, basically this class here, we define the twist callback to take in a twist message, which we can operate on, whatever we want to do with it. Is that 
Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Any questions so far? Okay. So we talked about Ross topics um, and subscriptions. How do we get more information about these topics? It's not like I could peek through. Sometimes if let's say your colleague uh, shares you a Ross package, um, you may not even have the source code for it. It could be just a post compile binary. Uh, how do you get more information about what, what topics, what message types pertain to the actual topic channel? And again, we're going to lean on the Ross client interfaces to help us do that. Specifically, the topic subcommand uh, allows you to get information about a specific topic channel. And in this case, it tells us this topic channel, the command vel topic channel, is passes through the twist message type, and it has one publisher and one subscriber. By the way, I'm helping. Uh, I'm highlighting various texts. Can people see that on the uh, on the slides, or is that not coming through? Okay, cool. Furthermore. What is a twist message type? Well, again, you could use the ROS client interface, command line interface, or CLI uh, short, to get more information about your twist message type. And you could do that with the interface subcommand to show me what this twist interface looks like. And what gets returned back is the definition of this twist message type. And uh, you, you can see on the screen, it's basically two vectors, a linear velocity and an angular velocity. You could get further more information about the actual message type because maybe you don't know what a vector three is, um, which, is which is what was returned when you said interface show. And to do that, you could say, hey, show me the prototype, the actual prototype. And it basically unrolls out the, the, the sort of uh, um, abstract, uh, abstract type names that have been uh, passed, that have been returned before via show. And it tells you that linear is actually composed of linear velocities composed of three various components, X, Y, Z, as well as uh, so is angular X, Y, Z. Remember, there were vector three classes, so you have to have three components in this vector. Um, for those who have a little bit of understanding about how, um, how robotics movement works, linear velocity is basically the velocity you move in a specific x, y, z direction. In in, for as a standard, x generally talks about um, the robot motion forward. Y will talk about the motion to your to your left, and Z motion toward the top. Angular, similarly, X talks about pitch. So uh, if you were a if you were a airplane, it would talk about how your nose dips up and down. Y would talk about roll, which goes how your airplane kind of uh, leans side to side, and Z is the rotational velocity, of how fast your uh, your airplane is turning on its side, um, so pointing its nose from left to right. In our 2D robot case for a Hattabot, we actually only care about two of these variables, despite the fact that twist actually is a 3D vector. We don't care about um, all, the, all the different variables. Since our Hattabot robot can only move forward and back, right, it can't go side to side instantaneously, we only care about its X linear velocity. And it can't roll or pitch because it's not an airplane. We only care about how it can pivot around its, its center, uh, which is the, effectively the yaw or around the Z axis. So we only care about the yaw angular velocity. Is, uh, hopefully, is everyone still at a three or higher, hopefully, in terms of understanding what's going on? Yeah, I take that as a yes. <laughs> we, we talked about how um, various nodes pass messages to each other. Try to find that. 
But we can actually do that. We can actually pass messages to nodes through the command line as well. And to do that, we invoke the topic subcommand again. And we tell, we tell the topic subcommand that we want to publish once, we want to publish one message on the topic command vel, the message type twist, and here are the parameters. And these parameters, uh, since x, the linear velocity is one, we are telling whoever cares about this particular twist message on the command vel topic to please drive forward at one unit per second. And generally, it will be meters per second. If we did this, if we typed in this command in our terminal, which you can do, you will see the Hattabot start turning its wheels to move forward. And this happens even though we didn't touch the UI at all. We basically told through the command line using the ROS2 client command line interface to actually to turn the robot wheels. Everybody good so far? So a little pop quiz. What parameter do we have to tweak to get the turtle, how about turtle, to stop turning its wheels? Anybody know? I'll give a couple of seconds, see if anybody can uh, punch in an answer here. Command C. Actually, unfortunately, that would not work. We just told the Hattabot to. Um, we just told the Hattabot to turn its wheels one meter or one unit per second. How do? What do we have to do? What do we have to publish? Uh, what message do we have to publish? Or what parameters of the twist message do we have to publish to get the Hattabot to stop turning its wheels? Anybody? Okay, so the way to do it, yes, linear, Kalata, you got it right. Uh, the linear velocity, if you specify instead of one, if you specify x colon zero and everything else stays the same, you would be telling the Hattabot to stop turning its wheels because you would be commanding that whatever is underneath and Hattabot uh, robot is underneath in terms of uh, um, the, the actual robot listening to these commands um, to to make your linear velocity zero, which, which means stop moving. Yeah, kind of like resetting it back, but uh, it's more accurate to say you just stopped the robot. You stopped any sort of linear or angular velocity. All velocity should be zero. And you're telling the robot that's, that's what you should do. Please make, make yourself stop uh, all velocity movement. So then the follow on uh, question would be, how would you make the Hattabot turtle turn? Which parameter would you need to tweak? I'll give you a little bit of a hint here. It's either the circle around the X or the circle around the Z, because those are the only two parameters. The, uh, a, a 2D differential, a 2D two wheeled robot would care about. Yep. So specifically the Z, the Z angular velocity, velocity needs to be changed to something other than zero. If you make it negative, it'll turn one direction. If you make it positive, it'll turn the other direction. Okay, anybody uh, have questions so far? Clockwise negative. I gotta think about that. I think it's, uh, let me think about that offline. I always forget it's a, it's a certain way you um, right hand rule, right? Yeah, you're right, probably. Yeah, you're right. Um, you don't even, so to further along the whole uh, concept of Ross topics and messages, you can actually peek in and listen to what messages are passed on certain topic channels. And you would do that we're using the subcommand topic, and you will want to echo a, the messages that come through a specific ROS topic. And uh, one example would be you can actually say ROS2 topic echo the Hattabot command veil. 
And every single time you go back to the teleop UI and you hit the up arrow and the side arrows, you'll actually see a different, um, you see a different twist message that gets outputted from your uh, from the command from your terminal window. You Ross also allows you to not even require a uh, require you to operate to listen or publish on topics that are established by certain nodes. You can echo or listen to a topic that hasn't even existed yet. For instance, if you do Ross topic echo workshop topic, it'll sit there and hang. And in another terminal window, you can actually publish uh, at a rate of one time a second, a workshop topic of a string type, a string message type with that says hello. And every second, this command line that you've invoked through publish minus R1 will output the string hello onto the workshop topic. And on your other window where you did the echo, you'll see the actual data come through. Pretty nifty. Any questions? All right. Well, I think I fire hosed everyone enough with, uh, with, with Ross in about an hour. Uh, in this hour, we talked, so uh, we talked a bunch about how ROS2, actually it's not just ROS2, this, these packet, the concept of packages and workspaces pertain to ROS1 as well. It's just ROS in general. We talked about uh, packages and how packages encompass various modules of robot functionality. We talked about workspaces, which is a bucket of various ROS packages. We talked about ROS nodes, where each package can implement one or more ROS nodes. And when you compile it, these raw, when you compile the package, these ROS nodes turn into binaries where you can use the uh, ROS command lines to run and launch uh, these nodes in some orchestrated manner. We talked about what ROS nodes are, nothing more than a, uh, a glorified uh, ROS executable. Each one of these nodes has its own main, so it's actually, it's on its own, so it, it is an executable. We talked about how nodes communicate to each other through topics, and these topics are like uh, phone numbers, and each topic defines a certain language um, that gets passed through, passed through, and those are called ROS messages. We walked through a bunch of ROS command line interface uh, commands to peek at various nodes, uh, to understand how the topics work, to understand uh, how the messages, what the messages look like. Uh, we also walked through some CLI examples where you can, um, when you can publish various messages onto arbitrary topics as well as listen to these topic and the data associated with them. We, whenever we could, we try to do a little bit of a code walkthrough to sort of uh, solidify um, map concept to actual code. Uh, and we did this through the specifically the Hadabot controller.cpp file, which implements the Hadabot controller node. Any questions so far? Still okay? My, my question is at more of a high level. So after I get the teleop working, which hopefully will be later today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm now ready to write my first code. So mm -hmm. let's say instead of using your interface to drive the robot forward, back, left, and right, mm -hmm. I want to write a simple program to maybe drive the robot in a circle mm -hmm. um, and then maybe even eventually read the encoders mm -hmm. and have the robot use that to drive in a, a square and correct for odometry error or something like that. Mm -hmm. Do I now do that in MicroPython inside of this wrapper and is there um, some resources you could provide for us for quickly learning ROS or how to do this inside of your platform like I don't know if there's a ROS for dummies book or a ROS for dummies link website somewhere or that's a great question so great question uh, it is something that I'm definitely going to work on in terms okay. of uh, some sort of a templated manner for people to start writing these more complicated functionalities mm -hmm. to drive their hat about turtle. Uh, but in the meantime, the best resource to get to understand enough on how to put 
how to create a package from scratch or how to implement a node from mm -hmm. scratch would be this, uh, the Ross tutorials. Okay. And uh, it's not, this is not an ideal answer for you, Carlotta, for what it's worth. Uh, the, the ideal way is to take your turtle and through a guided manner, be able to write the code and implement the ROS node yourself. And for what it's worth, there is a learning curve associated mm -hmm. with creating a ROS package and uh, even writing from scratch a blank slate, a ROS node as there are certain libraries and then the syntaxes that you need to adhere to. Um, you would not be doing this in MicroPython. So the MicroPython, is, the, the firmware that's written onto the Hattabot um, listens to two topics, how fast to turn the right wheel, how fast to turn the left wheel. Mm -hmm. And for all practical purposes, that's all that's needed in terms of turning the wheels. And all the high level code should be written in C++ or Python in your Docker container ROS environment, mm -hmm. compiled such, executed in your Docker container. And all that code needs to do is tell uh, the turtle how fast to turn each wheel mm -hmm. and for how long. Right, normally what I will tell my students is when you're learning and you're totally lost, start with sample code that you know works and modify it. So I would have them take the C++ code, maybe even the code that you use to make that interface that drives forward and backwards, mm -hmm. and just modify that such that the buttons on your interface work differently. Like maybe right and left buttons now make circles instead of right and left turns. Right. So instead of starting from scratch, look at something you know works and modify a little bit at a time with good commenting and see how that affects the robot behavior. That's, that's a great point. I think that's when I say I have uh, work ahead of me to create a more, uh, the, the next step basically, um, that's exactly uh, what I should be doing. And uh, um, Carlotta, I'm gonna be pinging you for feedback as I materialize all, these, uh, all this material. I have a quick question. Yes, um, Angel. I have the code. I did this robot, well not this one, but similar uh, with Arduino. And I was able to have the code for the autonomous robot. There is, is there a copy and paste situation <laughs> or no? Can I copy and paste the code that I have for the autonomous robot for Arduino with this? Uh, the short, the likely answer is no. But the longer answer would be if you wanted to show me what code that is, I could take a closer look to see if it probably is not a copy and paste, but might be a copy paste and tweak type scenario where you could get it to work. So okay. Angel, I do, I do Arduino programming for my robotics class, which is Sketch, which is very similar to C. So I think Jack's answer is correct. The algorithm that you use for your Arduino will be very similar. So if you could show the code and we can extract the algorithm from that, he just would have to modify it to be in the syntax that's appropriate for the Hattabot or the turtle, right? Or so, Ross, or Ross. Or Ross, right, right. So the high level theory is gonna be the same. It's just the Ross um, syntax is gonna have to be modified. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions? Well, so what's next? Uh, as I mentioned to Carlotta, for those who are interested in learning more about ROS concepts or writing your own, implementing your own node, node or packages, before I get a chance to put together a more cohesive uh, next, more intermediate um, next steps for what your Hattabot can do, you can look towards the ROS2 tutorials. They're actually very, very comprehensive, but a little overwhelming in the sense that they're, they wrote tutorials in a most generalized manner. And uh, sometimes it could be um, to, uh, an exercise in trying to figure out what you want to do, or what they told you you can do. Um, they also tell you, talk about a whole bunch of other ROS concepts. Um, I mentioned node, nodes, topics, and messages, but there are other node, ROS concepts such as services and actions. Um, there's other ways of programming ROS uh, other than C++. Python is actually the other first class citizen for programming ROS. Uh, if you are a, a user of another type of language, 
Um, there are community-driven interfaces, um, such as Rust, I believe, is supported. R may be supported as well. I'm not sure. But C++ and Python are the first-class citizens supported by the open robotics community. Um, there are also these things called launch files. Uh, have you you have may have deduced if ROS is if a ROS workspace includes the launching and orchestrating of potentially hundreds of nodes. Gosh, wouldn't it be a a, a brute mess to have to type in ROS to run a hundred times in a in a um, ordered manner to get your robot working? Well, launch files solves that problem. It's basically a script that helps you automate the running of your workspace, kicking off the nodes in a specific manner with this, uh, specific types of dependencies with different types of configurations. All this is mentioned in the tutorials. And if you have any questions with the, with the Rossu tutorials itself, uh, I'm also more than happy to answer. Uh, along with just general ROS2 questions, as you debug your Turtle, how about Turtle hardware and software environment, please do not hesitate to reach out to me to answer questions. I'm pretty responsive, unless I'm, uh, I'm trying to teach my kids how to write numbers and uh, read and do other things. I'm pretty responsive in, uh, in getting back to you as fast as I can. Some other things that I am uh, actively working on is some sort of intermediate robotics workshop uh, where it can bring in a more hands-on manner um, some way, some of the concepts of what Carlotta brought up, which is how to implement a node, uh, how to, from scratch, um, how to create a ROS package from scratch, uh, introduces something about services and actions. But more importantly, something I'm also going to do is, as I said before, this is really the first introduction robotics workshop um, that uh, Hadabot has given. Um, and I am actively thinking about what version two would look like to make it, um, I'll be totally honest, sometime uh, during the course of the hardware build, it's, uh, it, I could sense the participant frustration. It doesn't go as smoothly as possible. Um, during the software setup, it's also quite overwhelming. Uh, version two is uh, a, the, the, um, the taking the feedback of what happened during these workshops and making it better. And I don't hope I don't overextend uh, the uh, Black and Robotics uh, invitation here. For those who you guys already have had about Turtles, when we do launch a intro to work, intro to robotics workshop version 2.0, you anyone who attended version 1.0 or uh, the alpha version is more than welcome to attend the version 2.0 as sort of like a refresher or uh, a way to kind of like start over in, uh, in, in getting an introduction to robotics. Uh, my contact information is at the bottom. And last but not least, thank you guys so much for attending these workshops. Uh, I, as an educator, learned so much about how to give some of these via Zoom uh, and uh, also got a sense of how, the, um, how, how workshop attendees have put together the robot, how they're setting up the software. So I thank you so much. It, is, uh, it, it actually is a privilege of me to, have, to be able to talk about robotics with you guys. Any questions so far or thank you, Julie, for the thumbs up. <laughs> All right, let me stop the share here. Any other final questions or uh, considerations? Um, I tried to, two hours to me is always a bit long. So I tried to create a presentation that was an hour long. So we quite have quite a bit of time and um, if anyone has questions or wants to uh, continue working on their robot or has specific questions about Hadabot, the so hardware or software, you can ask right now. Curiosity question. I just want to get status update from the participants. Julie, how, how far did you get in your software? You can type in the chat if you want. And then similarly for Angel Software, actually I'm still installing Ubuntu as we speak. So you're putting it onto a um, USB. So you have Windows, Julie, is that correct? 
how you also have a Mac. Yeah, um, Jack, would it be beneficial to tell the Mac people how they can do it without having to wait for this um, gigabyte, gigabyte option or it's gonna take as long anyway, it doesn't matter? Uh, well, the, the Mac, it'll probably take just as long because the, the okay. Docker setup is, is what takes the longest in terms of pulling yeah, I took a nap and I woke up and it was finished. So I have no idea how long it took. <laughs> That's, a, that's probably the way to go. Big cup of coffee or a long nap. Yeah. Uh, but on Mac, it, it really, it comes down to this. The, the ESP32 microcontroller uh, for the v various Windows users that I've talked to, they have problems connecting to it. For Mac and Linux or Ubuntu specifically, it works out of the box. That's really the, the, the main kind of like uh, the main barrier to using a Windows machine. Otherwise, in theory, Windows has container support. It has uh, once you once you're in a container, it really is is operating system agnostic. Well, I'm going to give you some more homework after we get past all of the things I've already asked you to do, is to figure out the option for the Raspberry Pi um, to see if that's that would be easier because um, I now also have one of those. So I, okay. that's that's another thing I. So part of my sabbatical work is I want to get the hat about working in ROS, ideally, because I could then write a class around it. But we could also do it with the Raspberry Pi as another option. So now we don't have to split on our laptop because my students will be using their school laptop and they may not have but so many administrator rights to do so much. Right. So if we could then get it working on the Raspberry Pi. We just get everybody a Pi and that's now their robot controller. That would be fantastic. Um, whatever you so. whatever platform that could be standardized on just makes the setup that much easier. Right. And, uh, in terms of even a Raspberry Pi, once you get an image up and running, you can save off the image and people don't have to install anymore. All you have to do is just clone the operating system image onto another SD card and stick that SD card into the Raspberry Pi and it should just work. Um, yeah. It just makes the, the uh, and as, a, to, to, as a matter of fact, I even have a platform that fits the Pi that can be mounted on top of the turtle. So oh, good. yeah, you can actually fully make it autonomous in the sense that the Pi and the ESP32, because you still need a pin controller in some way, mm -hmm. uh, can all sit on the Hattabot and you don't need to have a Raspberry Pi sitting, sitting off in the separate space. I may be missing something. I am new, 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 new to robotics. Thank you for the thorough explanation, but my expectation coming away from here was that I'm going to press some button in the atmosphere and this thing is going to work. So I may have been under the, <laughs> the different impression than everyone else here, but is there a, a and it, there probably is a guide on your website, I'm not sure, of step one for those of us who are Mac users. What am I supposed to be doing now that I've put it all together and it's cute? I want it to move. So what do I do next? And that may not be the question everyone else has, but that's my question. So Angel, I'm gonna, I, I, will, I will send you an email about that. And uh, we can even set up a time to chat in person and uh, help you out along the way. Um, and um, yeah, I apologize. Uh, you know, I think that was generally the impression of this follow on software of software session. But uh, the reason why I moved away from that was I was afraid that everyone's problems were gonna be a little different. And what would happen is we'd be QAing one person's problem and then everyone else would just basically fall asleep. And, uh, and in the end, it just kind of like being we might as well have just done one-on-one -on -one sessions with individual people in an offline manner. So hopefully that, that that's the reason behind the madness of the uh, sort of the dive that we diverted away a little bit from what we were, uh, what we had told people to expect out of this uh, follow-on session. So Angel, if you, I'm sorry, Angel, if you walk through those links I sent you, because you and I are probably around the same spot, you're close. So I've done everything Jack sent in the email up to the point where the robot's moving. So I need to debug something that's wrong. But once you get there, there really is a web interface where you push buttons and the robot moves. So I think if you do that one-on-one -on -one with Jack, he'll get you there. Awesome. Thank you, guys. No, I thank you. Patience.
<laughs> no, no, thank you for your patience. This is, uh, I, I put, whenever any of you cannot get your robot set up, it's not your fault, it's my fault. So I'm learning, I'm learning how to make this experience better. And robotics is hard. Uh, it's hard to, forget about like just implementing algorithms, hard to even get a robot up and running. So um, I appreciate your patience. And Angel, for what it's worth, the fact that you have a Mac is actually easier. So uh, let's, uh, let's find up some time. Um, next week and uh i'm around thanksgiving if you have time so throughout the whole week let's try to get it working for you excellent thanks i appreciate it now angel i need you to keep that hot chocolate off the robot though you know i i have the milk and i have the starbucks hot chocolate so i'm so excited about this <laughs> <laughs> I've already named both of my robots, so they have names, so we have to make them work, okay? <laughs> yes. No liquids, though. The robot can bring you the packet, the powder packet only. <laughs> okay, I'll accept the packet this time. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, uh, perhaps we'll let people carry on with their, with their Sunday afternoons. Ari, how are you doing with your robot? Uh, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I haven't had time to uh, retry the code out. Uh, I'm in the process of moving. Um, but other, other than that, it's uh, going well. Cool. So um, again, if you have any questions, let me know and we can set up a one-on-one -on -one time. Um, you guys are not imposing on my time because through these one-on-one -on -one sessions, I learn a whole ton to make the next iteration of instructions better. So you're, uh, you're actually uh, helping me while I help you. And to the facilitators, our next session introductory will be December 13th. And we are modifying it a little bit where we're requesting all participants to have steps one through seven done. So when they show up, we're just doing wiring, which is probably the more difficult part breadboarding and then when if we finish that we can even transition into some of what jack started today that sounds great and um for what it's worth if i can get a, a less right now as uh, all the participants as well as facilitators know there's these instructions there's like a monolithic instruction to get everything done uh i hope before the next introduction to workshop happens introductory workshop uh, happens I hope to change the instructions a little bit such that you build a little, test a little, learn a little. And then basically through these three steps, um, iterating through these three steps, you complete your Hattabot robot rather than just build and then push a button, <laughs> which is overwhelming. So Julie is asking about a Facebook group. We don't have one of those um, right now. The main way is um, Twitter and I email people. We do have a Black and Robotics Slack, but it's not necessarily just for the workshop. One thing we could do, because allies are on there, is make a channel for the robotics workshop on the Slack. That's a thought. Or maybe use the outreach channel that Ari already made and share that with the group. What do you think? Okay, I'll send everybody the Slack channel then so that you can go in and join and we can post information there as well. I think Jack had suggested that a while ago and Lazy Lada never did. <laughs> So thank you guys all for coming. We've enjoyed you and we appreciate you and have a great rest of your Sunday. Jack, your next um, text for me should be, I got my robot moving, or I may just send you the video. Sounds great. And if you need help, let me all know. Right. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a great Sunday, everybody. Thank you so right. much. Thanks. <laughs>